Um, Mike Bailey, uh, he's a professor here at the um, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Um, he re does research on security, networking, and distributed systems. And I think this particular group is really going to find him interesting because Mike has a history of doing a lot of a very applied research, uh, touching on everything from social aspects um, to cybercrime, to you name it. And of course, he's been a, a collaborator with Vern and Robin and many of us over many years and a uh, competitor at one point. I, I competed to get for the Predict repository many years ago um, against him. Um, he's been involved in several startups, uh, including Arbor Networks. He was the uh, director of engineering. And finally, Mike is just a really good guy. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Welcome. All right, good morning. Oh. Let's see here. Yeah, I have volume control issues, so it's gonna be a challenge for the people in the booth. We'll see how this goes. So, uh, thanks Adam. As you said, my name is Michael Bailey. I'm an associate uh, professor here at the University of Illinois, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the research that me and my group have done over the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, when you get invited to do one of these keynotes, first of all, it means that you're getting to be old. Um, and I took that as license to uh, uh, pontificate a little bit. Um, my wife is always uh, happy to remind me that I don't need an excuse to pontificate. Uh, it's what I do and do best. Uh, but I thought, okay, maybe what I'll do is I'll reflect on the kinds of things that we've done in our group and try to figure out what really mattered of all the work that we've done. So I've had a, uh, a fairly long history uh, of sort of split between a practitioner, somebody who did programming, somebody who did security in practice out in real companies, whether those companies were Fortune 500 companies, whether they were startups, and a, a career in academia, whether that was at the University of Michigan where I got my PhD and was research faculty, or more recently here at the University of Illinois. And so as I started to think about, as my wife says, pontificate, uh, what, I would, what, I, what I would say is, I started to think about, okay, what's happened in the landscape over the last 20 years, and how has our work tried to attack the problems in that landscape? So the way that I think about the evolution of cybersecurity threats over the last 20 years is in this sort of very broad sort of three uh, phases or three parts of a life cycle. In the very early years, and when I mean early years here, I'm talking about around the emergence of, okay, you know, somebody could have told me that it's not going to be called bro anymore. Uh, in my talk, so you'll have to apologize that I'm going to have bro, outdated bro references. But, you know, around the time that question marks started in 1999, um, uh, we're talking about attacks that are primarily vandalism. Uh, you know, if you think back to the Morris worm, this was a proof of concept, kind of. Never expected it to get out of the jail environment. Could this thing even work? But then people started to pick up on those kinds of things, and, and it really looked like this very unfortunate picture of the alma mater here at, at U of I, which, oh, by the way, had just been um, unveiled after they had finally repaired the last set of vandalism a week or two after they unveiled the statue again here on the campus, so we went and vandalized it again. Um, but it was this sort of very, you know, almost, uh, I can say with some, some uh, uh, some clarity, 13-year-old, because I have 13-year-olds at home, that were responsible for this kind of thing. One of my favorite examples in this era is this uh, I love you, San, you know, blast, uh, uh, version of Blaster, right? Where the person had just written the worm so that they could spread the message that they, they really, really, really cared about their girlfriend uh, to computers far and wide. And while there was certainly damage I mean, uh, you look at the, the alma mater, there's certainly damage and it's cost to clean these kinds of things up. People were really not doing this for money. They were doing it to, to prove that they could uh, to be vandals. And then we switched, and I'm hoping that now, I, I, I give this slide, by the way, in my class. One of the things that I, that I find really, 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 really depressing is that not everybody knows this reference anymore. So say, who knows what this reference is? 
Okay, right? So this is the Superman movie, right? When they don't get this, my next go-to is what? Office space. So exactly, I'll say office space. And it's actually getting to the period of time where they're not getting the office space reference anymore either. <laughs> Again, so you know, this is another reason that when you know that you're old. But you know, the next sort of phase I thought of this work is, OK, we moved away from, hey, doing things because we could do them, and let's just see. Right to, hey, look, those computers that we're vandalizing actually are valuable. They have information that we want. We can use them as a resource to make more money. Uh, and, and so maybe instead of uh, taking those computers down, making them inaccessible or broken, maybe I should, in fact, actually keep them around and use them. My absolute favorite example in this era of this is fake antivirus. I love the fact that I convinced you to install on purpose a Trojan on your machine and then get you to pay for that installation so that you can have service on the Trojan that you've installed. So absolutely not only stealing your data, uh, but, uh, but uh, looking for other ways to monetize you as well. And then finally, more recently, sort of this, this idea that money is just one kind of power. Right? And that we're seeing folks utilize cyberspace to project power in a variety of different ways. Whether that's censorship, whether that's cyber war, whether that's advanced persistent threats and espionage, people are thinking about these as an important space uh, uh, to be in. And we see this happen now uh, uh, very, very concretely. This is a map of the cyber attacks in Ukraine that mapped alongside of the kinetic attacks uh, that were happening on the ground. So as I was thinking about all those 20 years, I said, oh, wow, we've done some great stuff. This, this place has evolved. I kind of feel a little bit like pump. This is what the, I'm going to write my talk about. I'm Batman. I'm fighting the good fight. Um, and so let's go take a look at what the state of, you know, and we did a bunch of different work, networking, security, uh, data-centric, internet-wide kinds of measurement. Like I'm feeling pretty good about myself. And I said, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the actual data, though. How good have we done over the last 20 years? Okay, so this is some data uh, from the Arbor Network Security Intelligence Report. I happened to work for Arbor for a while, but Arbor is, is the premier DDoS protection uh, 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 software company in the world. This is their ISP's self-reported largest attack seen in their networks. And of course, the problem with this graph is it goes up and to the right. OK, so maybe we're not doing so great about with DDoS. Let's go ahead and take a look at spam. Uh, that line goes up and to the right. Uh, OK, how about malware and antivirus? That goes up and to the right. Uh, OK, phishing and online. That goes up and to the right. Now again, up and to the right would be good if we were talking about you know, bro penetration and market share. Not so great when we're talking about the threats that we're trying to manage. So I come off of my high of, look at all this great research that we've done over the last 20 years, and get slapped with a cold uh, 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 bucket of water when I look at the reality. So instead of being Batman, I'm kind of a sad clown. And it sort of you know, got me to the point, again, and this was oh, maybe about two weeks before the, the, uh, uh, the keynote, and I'm thinking, OK, what the heck am I going to talk about? Um, we haven't done anything useful. Uh, there's no way that this was a useful waste of 20 years of my time. I should go into a different business. So uh, of course, it, it hit upon me. Let's go look for examples of things that we view as a success. So uh, I was reading, as I often do, at least once a week, the original 1999 paper uh, uh, by Paxson on Bro. And you know, the very first line in the abstract says, we're going to do two things. We're going to detect network intruders by doing this monitoring. And the more I thought about what was happening and what was being said, the more I liked this as a model for what we want for being successful. There was a clearly defined goal. There was an operational problem that was trying to be solved. And particularly, we were looking for network intruders. And we're going to do that by doing something that maybe there were other people doing, but was actually a hard problem. Uh, you know, doing things at line speed. In fact, actually, this is some of the magic that we talk about now. Being able to write, have the right scripts run at line speed in the right place on the right hardware uh, is m sometimes more than a little bit of magic. And so I asked myself, so what did I really like about that? Well, what I liked about it is it resonated 
with me uh, as this person that bridges both uh, being a practitioner and being an academic. And it reminded me of this book by Donald Stokes called Pasteur's Quadrant. And it talks about a new model for thinking about what the value of science is in society. And it really uh, uh, moves away from the existing traditional view that uh, uh, doing anything but pure science is a distraction from the scientific enterprise. That if you start doing a scientific inquiry with some practical goal or objective in mind, you're going to distract from doing the core basic science that you need to do. Instead, what's supposed to happen is that science is supposed to sit way over here, and it's supposed to be some sort of downstream generator of technological growth and of innovation, which is to say there's supposed to be some linear tech transfer mechanism where you go over here, you do basic science and a bunch of papers, and then somebody else comes by and says, oh, there's an application of those papers, and then, okay, we'll take that application and we'll go get some funding, and we'll go off and start a company and go build a product. Okay? And what, what, what Stokes was really challenging, this idea that this is not the linear model. In fact, these two things are much more combined than you, than you think. And he posited this thing called Pasteur's Quadrant. So he says, instead of thinking of this as this sort of linear model of how to, how to, do, how to uh, uh, make impact and how to do science, instead, these two things co-evolve across two axes. Okay? You have some work which is only concerned with the basics or fundamentals of science. Things like uh, 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 Bohr, whose, whose initial hypotheses were only about understanding the universe. There was no practical application in mind, although of course have been, uh, from that work. Contrasted with something like, like Edison, who, uh, uh, as they say in the book, didn't leave any of his helpers time to think about uh, why they were doing what they were doing. They were just moving too fast. It reminds me actually of the early version of, of Facebook, right? Move fast and, and break the build, right? This is basically that version. And, and of course, up into the right in this case is good. And what we mean here is that Pasteur chose a scientific endeavor in which we didn't have models about which the way the universe worked, but whose answers to those models, the creation of those models and understanding was actually going to solve a concrete societal problem. Okay? And so hopefully you now see that tie back to what I was talking about before. I hold in my mind this notion of bro as one of, the, uh, one of these kinds of projects that is at one time solving an important societal problem, visibility into networks, uh, insight into the security of your networks, the actors inside those networks, and at the same time is not only informing how one measures these networks themselves, but it's also been used expansively to understand networking and distributed systems as a whole. And so, of course, you know, because you're in this room uh, and you travel to be here, uh, Bro tackles a bunch of these important problems. When I say what are the societal problems, I mean being able to give you visibility into what's happening inside of your network. Okay? And the Bro team has spent a lot of time, and these are some of the titles of some of the more recent NSF grants, uh, uh, investigating how one can improve the state of, measure, state of measurement which is how can one improve the tool? How can one paralyze it? How can one do things at scale? But if you look at the papers that are also enabled by the infrastructure that are being created, they span the entire spectrum of networking distributed systems and applications. And of course, back to the good version of up and to the right, what we want to see in a project like this is contributions both to the basic science as well as to solving societal problems. Here we have a proxy for both of those. This is a, a slide I think uh, Vern gave for a keynote a couple years ago, uh, looking at the amount of citations as a proxy for that academic impact, and the number of downloads of the distribution as a proxy for who's running it and, and what they're doing with it. OK, so now we're about, oh, two days, three days. This is this weekend. It finally occurred to me that this is what the pitch for the, paper, the talk should be. So what should the rest of the talk look like then? So I want to talk about use-inspired research. So what does it mean to be meaningful in an environment when you're never going to have a fully secure internet? 
Okay? When the reality is all the lines are going, all the bad lines are going up and to the right. How can you extract meaning from the work that you do? Well, I think you look to be something like the Bro Project has been. So you try to tackle a real problem. You see that there's a societal problem that needs to be addressed, and you go after that problem. And you learn to, during the course of going after that problem, not only to build better mousetraps here, better instrumentation, better measurement, better methodology, but also to more broadly inform computing and computer science as you do that. And as I said before, I think that Bro is a great example of this. And I want to talk in the time that I have uh, remaining today about a couple examples of this from my work as well. The first of these is network telescopes. So what is a network telescope? So obviously, we already know, because you people in this room are in fact monitoring your networks, that, th that the network and the internet as a whole is filled with significant amounts of malicious activity and non-productive kinds of traffic. So these kind of things could be DDoS traffic, they could be worm, they could be traffic associated with botnets or APTs, uh, they could be misconfigurations. And one of the ways that we get visibility into this phenomenon is that we actually have a little bit of an advantage over the attackers. It's one of the places where there's an asymmetry in our favor. And that's in an address allocation. We actually happen to know, or at least we should know if we run our networks the right way, which IP addresses are live and what's supposed to be on them versus which IP addresses are uh, inactive or unused. Okay? The adversary has to go looking for that information. And the process of them looking for that information, the scanning, looking for hosts, leaves artifacts. And they leave artifacts in interesting places. So in this particular case, the idea behind a network telescope is rather than drop packets to unused address space on the floor, instead what we're going to do is collect them and monitor them. Okay, so you've got a slash 24 that you're using for a DHCP block. You could, for example, cut that and, you know, if you don't have the users using all of it, you could cut that in half, use half that block, and, uh, and use it for monitoring. You could have a slash 24 laying around, uh, uh, whatever you might have in terms of address space. We'll talk about some different options for this in a little bit. But the basic idea is, because you're monitoring that non-productive traffic, Okay, rather than simply dropping on the floor because it's not there, you can get some insight into a variety of different things. That could be scanning, that could be worms that look like scanning activity, that could be increasingly things like misconfiguration, this could be backscatter from denial of service attacks, and all of these give you some modicum of insight. One of the things that we built uh, at the very beginning of my stint in graduate school is this thing called the Internet Motion Sensor. So what the Internet Motion Sensor was, was a distributed collection of these unused blocks that were globally routed, but were unused. And we used it as an early warning and detection system for, at the time, worms, but also for quantifying things like net network-wide scanning, as well as um, um, backscatter activity. And so at its peak, uh, uh, it had uh, 17 uh, million IP addresses. Uh, this was mostly because at the time we had an unused slash 8. Um, the, the company that owns that slash 8 has learned that that's valuable in IPv4 now and has started to auction off pieces of it. Um, my slash 8 gets smaller and smaller every day. Uh, but we still have roughly a slash, a slash 9. So a huge number of addresses. And then we had distributed sensors across a variety of different topological places as well. And as I said, this started out with a use. We said, hey, look, monitoring unused address space is useful for seeing these kinds of traffic. So the very first thing we did was, let's go profile or characterize the behaviors of the phenomena we were interested in. Back in the day, this is uh, an example of the blaster worm. Uh, one of the great things that you could start to see, well, great things. Uh, you know, scientists get uh, excited about the weirdest things. But um, uh, one of the interesting things that I like about the, the work we do with the blaster paper is that you know, it helps us develop models for the growth and decay of these kind of phenomena. So you go and empirically grab data, and you can look at this massive sort of exponential growth, and this decay is measured by a half-life, and then some period, very, very interestingly later, of year-over-year -year persistence of uh, boxes in networks that are just not getting cleaned up. And as I said before, we were interested in scanning activity. 
uh, uh, one of the interesting things sort of uh, in this early work is it's just sort of on the cusp of this realization by attackers that these hosts are not just going to be, as we were talking about before, useful to vandalize, but they were useful resources. So we started to see some of this bot versus bot kind of behavior, where a worm would go off and infect a pile of machines. And sometime later, a couple of weeks later, you'd see somebody sequentially scanning for the back doors that were installed by the previous piece of software, so they can then themselves install their software afterwards. And this was sort of the, the, this era where people were starting to realize, hey, yeah, maybe what we should do is not launch a denial of service attack when we get this. Maybe we should combine all these resources and do something useful. And sort of, you can watch based on the skin activity, the kind of emergence of this ecosystem around botnets. And as I said before, this is also uh, uh, a very interesting way in which this unused or non-productive traffic can give you insight into denial of service attacks as well. So it's the case that some fraction of denial of service attacks uh, in this, uh, back in this time frame were spoofed. And the idea at the time for spoofing was simply to um, uh, uh, hide the trail, uh, uh, a forensics trail, of where the attacks were coming from. I would randomize my source address. And because there was no anti-spoofing in place, or very little anti-spoofing at the place in place, um, it made it very difficult at the destination to figure out where that packet actually came from. But one of the artifacts of randomizing and randomizing over the entire space is every once in a while, you would pick one of my unused addresses as your fake source address. And so when the attack server got knocked on, say, with a SYN packet, the response back would go not to the attacker, but rather to this made up return address that you had inside the packet. Okay? And you can get some visibility, uh, some great work from the folks at uh, uh, UCSD on thinking about you know, how one can leverage that to get a, a good uh, uh, insight into the size, the scope, and scale of denial of service attacks on the internet. So as I said before, you have to start with this idea of uh, some societal problem you want to solve. In the case of IMS, in the case of this network telescopes, it was to go after understanding these security phenomena that were important to us at the time, the scanning, the denial of service attacks, the worm and worm propagation. But as your understanding of these kind of mechanisms start to grow, you start to learn how to do the measurement, how uh, to improve the quality and quantity of information that you get back from the tool. So in the years that followed our initial use of, of IMS, we had a sequence of papers that looked at different ways to make this uh, um, uh, network telescope more and more effective. So I sort of alluded uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the first slide that the, the easy way to do this is to take some, some statically unused block of IP addresses in your network and spin them up and monitor the packets to them. Well, it turns out you can do a lot more than that. If you're interested, for example, in um, every unused address across multiple subnets in your, in your network, what you could do is have one of these uh, fall-through routes. So you could, spec you could take a slash 16, you start allocating slash 24s out of that slash 16. Uh, you know, routing tables work by most specifics. So you have some fall through right at the bottom that sort of picks up all the unused space. And rather, again, than throwing that on the ground, it routes it off some interface that you're monitoring with some tool, PCAP or other kinds of tools. Uh, okay? um, you can look at outbound traffic from your network. So if you're interested in, importantly, what your clients are doing, there's absolutely no reason that your clients should ever be sending packets to what we'll call Bogon space, space that's reserved, space that's unallocated, uh, space that's not currently routed. Okay? So this gives you insight into what your users and your clients are doing in, in, in your network as well. So a lot of different ways that we can, can sort of improve the number of IP addresses and the amount of monitoring that we're doing simply by watching what's used and what's not used and leveraging the perspective that a defender has that the adversary doesn't. And as I said before, you start to get good at the practice of this kind of measurement. So you start to, for example, build models of how much traffic you expect to see, what is the rate of background radiation or observed sort of uh, uh, floatsome and jetsome that you see on the network. Um, could you predict how much 
uh, of that traffic was going to happen? Could you uh, provision your machine such that you had the, enough memory and enough disk to make those things practical? But then, as you get better and better at the practice of doing this, you start to realize that there are deeper observations that can be made about what you're doing that go beyond simply enhancing the measurement. And of course, there's nothing wrong with enhancing the measurement. Uh, uh, this has been an important uh, 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 thing to do for science for quite some time. Uh, but you start to look at understanding things more broadly than that. One of the things that came out in some of this work, and one of the things that actually uh, made up a bunch of my thesis a very, very long time ago, um, was this idea of um, breadth and depth. So, uh, and it was really talking about this tension between breadth, depth, and then the associated cost of running some monitoring infrastructure. By breadth, what we meant was some spectrum between, oh, I'm just doing local monitoring inside of my network, versus getting something like IMS, which had a global scope across multiple sensors and multiple networks. By depth, we meant the fidelity by which we were able to convince this adversary who's looking for targets to attack that there was actually interesting stuff here. Okay? So on one set of the spectrum, you have these network telescopes, which are completely passive. Right? You can route the packets out. Uh, what would have happened to them in the first place is they would have been dropped on the floor anyway. So the adversary has no idea, for the most part, that you're monitoring this traffic. Okay? Uh, but because it's silent, they don't do anything with it afterwards. You knock on the door, nobody's there, you move on to the next door. Well, I guess if you're an attacker, you knock on the door, if no one comes, you go in. But uh, the network analogy is different. Um, and so you could talk about techniques, for example, like a SYNAC responder, where all you might simply do is anytime somebody knocks on the door with a TCP SYN, uh, is respond back with a SYNAC. Okay? Doesn't matter what port they're asking for, doesn't matter what they do. Why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because that oftentimes is enough to elicit the first payload packet from the adversary. This is useful for things like NetBIOS, web, and other things. You could, of course, start to run your own machines, and there's a spectrum of doing that as well. These things are called honeypots, right? And so you could do this kind of thing in emulation. Of course, emulation has a problem that you can figure out if you're being emulated. So we do virtual machine-based uh, isolation and run honeypots in virtual machines. Red pill and blue pill say we can figure these things out as well. You can go all the way out to you know, bare metal, network-booted hardware where the BIOS is soldered so you can't rewrite the BIOS. Right? If you're talking about an extreme of trying to convince an adversary that there's really something there that they can't profile. And as I said, it's sort of implied when we were going at that, that, that uh, conversation on the previous slide, is that there's a trade-off here. There's more cost associated with each one of these, uh, but they offer more visibility into different kinds of threats. And they also illustrate some very interesting ideas in the attacker ecosystem. And as I've talked about before, the very first thing you worry about as a, as a defender, if you're using these kinds of systems when you're talking about depth, is this idea that you can be fingerprinted. That somebody can figure out that you're trying to trap them and get inside and just simply do something completely different. Ignore them most cases. But sometimes we've seen things in the case of, for example, VMs where they'll crash the VM when they know that they're being monitored. Okay. Another interesting thing that comes up is, OK, so let's assume that you want to go up this depth spectrum somewhere. Because you're really, 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 really interested in, say, attacks against TLS. Okay, So to do that, you can't just run, you just can't collect all the port 80 packets or port 443 packets that come in. Okay, Nor can you just run a SYNAC responder. Right? You have to actually run some versions of the software you want to test. Okay. So that's fine if you know an a priori what it is that you're interested in. But if what you're interested in is network visibility, well, what do you put in your honeypots? What do you configure them with? A couple Windows boxes? How accurate, how representative is of, the, of your vulnerability landscape are a couple of Windows XP boxes? Right? If you're using this to get some visibility into what the attacker is doing, then what you configure in those boxes should be something that's a close approximation of what you're running in your network. Okay? And it turns out this is actually really hard to do. And it involves some additional monitoring yourself. 
So we went and looked, in this particular table, went and looked at uh, uh, five or six different networks and profiled the combination of port, protocol, and application. And in a bunch of these, we found that the most common web server configuration in some of these academic networks is the APC uh, 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 web interface for the power cyclers in the data center, followed by the web interface on the printers. Okay, So if you're going to go uh, figure out what your web vulnerability profile is going to be, you're not going to run a bunch of Apache servers. You need to know that this is what your network looks like, and you need to, know, you need to be able to run things that look like uh, what the attacker might see. And then the other thing, which I just love as a measurement person, is this notion of uh, uh, the fact that what you measure uh, affects what you see. So we're looking here, look at the, uh, the, uh, the blue and the uh, yellow lines here. The blue line is in the same address block, running some sub-block with active responders in it. And the yellow line is moving it completely passive. And note the log scale. Okay? So simply the artifact of looking for more detailed information increases the number of connections, not the number of packets, but the actual number of connections, attempts to that network. If you light up your network, people will come. And of course, it wasn't just about understanding depth. We noticed that there were starting to be subtleties in how we understood uh, breadth as well. So clearly, more is better. More is better, no pun for, on David, by the way. Um, more is better because uh, it gives us faster detection when we're talking about watching for some global propagation. The more space you're monitoring, the quicker you're going to see some global activity start to emerge. Um, we certainly thought about diversity. We've seen different kinds of behaviors at different places. So uh, this issue of where you might place that space became really interesting. So great, we'll get more space, that's better, we'll do faster detection. But if I'm noticing differences in the monitors that you know, my sensor is giving you different data than, than your sensor is giving different data than someplace else, how do we figure out where to place that? How do we figure out how to share that information amongst ourselves? And it turns out that if you start to answer some of these placement issues, you get into some really, really subtle and interesting science behind uh, the way that attackers think about these problems in terms of moving away from global to more targeted attacks where I'm only interested in getting your network, uh, artifacts of what policies actually configure, because of course what you have your network configured to look like affects what my measurements might look like. Um, this idea of how long a time frame you measure and how long the event is happening as uh, traded off with the size of the monitoring that you're doing all have interesting effects. Uh, attackers apply different propagation strategies when you're talking about automated threats like worms. So these all play into which sensors see more data. Uh, there are hot spots and design errors. There's a great set of, of work by one of my colleagues at Michigan at the time looking at you know, uh, issues in not knowing how to, you know, they didn't take the crypto class, right? So they don't see their random number generators uh, as an example. Um, some, some great errors there. And then just some basic stats, you know. <laughs> what does a random process look like? Uh, how can one go about measuring them? And as we started to answer these more subtle issues about uh, the implications in the field, we also noted that over the course of 20 years, this technique became useful for things that we hadn't even thought of yet. So one of the things that uh, we shed a bunch of light on is this, uh, this notion of address allocation. How do, how do networks actually allocate their networks, right? What fraction of the global internet is routed within a, within a block? Which other blocks are lit up? How are they lit up? Are they lit up by DHCP and other things? What ports are actually in use? Because of course, we were interested in maximizing the space for ourselves to watch, but this actually had very, very interesting implications when you think of, for example, IPv4 scarcity now and moving on to IPv6. Uh, we found that this kind of technique was useful for understanding not only global outages on the network, but security policy and filtering. So pervasive is this background radiation, this junk that you can monitor with the dark net, that the absence of this junk from some network actually tells you something. So there's been some great work, again, from some of the folks at, at UCSD on using this to do outage detection. 
So there was a bunch of background noise coming from your network, junk, infected machines, scanning, whatever. All of a sudden, it dropped off the face of the Earth. There's no signal anymore. Something actually happened to the reachability of your network. We were actually able to use this in some of our studies to figure out how pervasive policy filtering is. You want to know who puts in outbound filters for TCP 445 to block at least the perception that you're not infected by Configur. You are. You have some hosts that are. You, do, you know you do. But at least nobody else is going to see them if you drop that on the floor on the way out. Right? And we can get some sense of uh, how pervasive that policy is as well. And again, by monitoring these, way, these network telescopes in unexpected ways. Even using this thing for looking at uh, IPv6 adoption. So we ran a bunch of very, 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 very large network telescopes to study IPv6 adoption. It is, in fact, at one point, we were the default route for the IPv6 internet. So if there was a packet and it didn't know how to get someplace, it came to us. Okay? And one of the things that we found with that level of visibility in V6 is there are a bunch of networks, uh, almost 30% of the traffic that we received, traffic we received in the darknet was the result of large amounts of instability in the IPv6 networks. Routes were dropping, connectivity was dropping, and traffic was going off uh, what normally would have dropped on the floor, we were able to go take a look at. So again, in sort of very unsurprising, in very, uh, not unsurprising, very surprising ways, uh, it moved from a tool that had a specific use to an improved understanding of how to measure the phenomenons with that tool to something more broader that informed both networking, distributed systems, and security. So I want to talk a little bit about this second use case um, of use-inspired research, uh, internet scanning. So while I was at Michigan, some of my colleagues, this is not a project that, that I was involved in initially, uh, created this tool called ZMAP. How many of you have heard of ZMAP? All right, everybody knows the ZMAP guys. Right, so uh, you know, their claim to fame is that you can do an internet-wide scan if you're well-provisioned enough in 43 minutes, uh, 44 in this slide, I guess. But there's actually a version of this that goes down to four minutes um, if, you have, if you're well-provisioned enough, uh, which is you know, some significant fraction of gigabit line speed. You just basically can spew packets as fast as you can. And there's a bunch of really cool uh, engineering tricks that allow them to do these kinds of things, including stateless scanning. Um, after they built the tool, I started getting involved with the team and, do, and looking at what one could do with the data that was collected from these internet scale measurements. One thing I don't know if you know is that the, the ZMAP team that does these regular scans, how many of you know ZMAP because you have some filter or opt out because you've asked them to stop scanning you? Oh, that's nice of you. Very, very nice of you all to participate. Um, I was gonna say, uh, you know, what can we do positively with that data? Right? So uh, have any of you used this website? A couple of you. If you're familiar with ZMAP, you absolutely should use this website. So this is Census. This is the front end to all the scan data over multiple years that were collected on any port at any time that the ZMAP team scanned from Michigan. There are years of data for certain protocols like web and certificates we'll talk about, but more recently data on ICS devices, on CWMP devices, on UPnP devices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? You can get a free uh, user account. Uh, you're limited to five, go play with it now. You can do five queries free per IP address. I don't know if we're natted here, so how, how, many, how quickly you guys are all get to your limit. But, <laughs> um, uh, 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 you can do five queries for free, and then you can register. And register simply says, hey, look, I'm a, I'm a researcher, or I run a network, and I want to look up things in my network. And that's good enough. Okay? And you can ask all kinds of interesting queries. So uh, the original, if you ask the guys that wrote it, the original societal use for doing fast internet-wide scanning was we were interested, they were interested in exploring the certificate ecosystem. So the first paper we wrote with that team was an analysis of TLS and HTTPS. So I think everybody knows that anything uh, that wants to ensure integrity and confidentiality on the internet almost certainly runs over HTTPS, some small fraction over, oh, over uh, SSH. Okay? Um, and you know, when you do your banking, when you do your private searching, everything over HTTPS is designed to provide confidentiality, integrity, and authentication. 
all of this, the magic behind all of this is uh, this PKI, or public key infrastructure, which consists of thousands of certificate authorities which we rely to help us say that Amazon.com actually is Amazon.com and not somebody impersonating that website. And this all works through this web of trust. The root of trust for your PKI is your browser store. So your browsers have a set of certificates that sign chains of certificates that go all the way down to the website that you contact. So you go contact a website, say Amazon.com, you get a certificate from them, you follow a chain of trust between Amazon through to perhaps intermediaries all the way up to some certificate that's in your browser store that Mozilla put there, that IE put there, that Microsoft put there, that Google put there, and it says, oh yes, uh, only uh, somebody following that chain could have signed this website, therefore it must be Amazon. And one of the things that's interesting about this ecosystem is it's pretty opaque. So you know what the certificates are in your browser, because you can go to your browser and open them up and see. Okay? But you don't know who are all the rest of these people in the certificate ecosystem that have the ability to tell you or vouch for Amazon and say that Amazon is really who Amazon is. So it seems to me that if we're going to base all of our trust on the internet, my banking on Citibank or PNC, based on some ecosystem, somebody better tell me who the, who the members of that ecosystem are and how good of a job they're doing at what they're supposed to do. And so that's what this was really to do. So they used this scanning technique to go out and measure this ecosystem. The only way you're going to do this, the only way you're going to, to enumerate what this ecosystem looked like is to talk to every website that's publicly visible on the internet and follow the chain of trust up and see what intermediates were involved. There's no list of them someplace that you can go grab magically. Okay, So that's what we did. 110 scans of the IPv4 address space over an 18-month period, over two, uh, nearly 2 billion TLS handshakes, and collected some largish pile at the time of certificates. And of course, as you'd expect, given that this is a security talk, um, this stuff is horribly, horribly managed. Now, it's getting better, slowly, arduously. I cannot say that it's in a good space now, uh, but slowly we're starting to pay attention. But back in the day, um, uh, 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 there were all kinds of problems. So all, one of the biggest ones, to my mind, is, is the first bullet. Only seven of the CA certificates, these are intermediate certificates that can sign for another organization. Okay? Uh, certificate signing certificates. Um, we're constrained in any way. Okay, there's a built-in mechanism that says, hey, look, I'll let you create uh, a signing cert, but only for things in Illinois. This prevents, you know, if I buy one of these, then I don't have to go back and pay Symantec or whoever over and over and over again for every new web server I put up, I actually get the authority to create new signed certificates. Okay? And the way that we're supposed to constrain that is through these, through these name constraints. Say, oh, you can only do this for things Illinois.edu. Well, only seven had actually name constraints, which basically means that everybody else could sign any certificate for any domain, nsa.gov, google.com, cityday.com. Okay? We have mechanisms to stop it, but no one was using them. Um, weird things that people don't know how to use these things, like mail.asterisk. Not, not asterisk.google.com, but mail.asterisk. So that we didn't have to have different certs for anything that was a mail server at any domain we happened to be in. Weird. <laughs> um, and all kinds of short-sightedness. You know, if you look at, for example, the cryptographic key lengths inside these certs, which are supposed to be, you know, strong enough so that an adversary can't do something uh, to forge one of these things, um, uh, you can look at the years to expiration and when NIST says we should deprecate 1024-bit keys and how many certs are still going to be live, active with these keys for years past the deadline of when we're supposed to have them. So first of all, there's a weird idea that you're going to keep your cert around for 20 years, which these guys are really weird to me in the first place. Okay? But the idea that you would do that and then keep some very, very weak, right? Why does this have these standards? Right? Because of Moore's Law. Right? You lose every 18 months, you lose one bit of key length because computational power has just gotten faster. Right? So the adversary has just that much more time. Uh, 
all kinds of other client uh, difficulties. So uh, uh, only 45%, I won't go through all of this, but only 45% of the certs uh, that we found in CS actually configured their services the way they were supposed to configure them. All right. So one of the things, um, as I said before, you start with this idea that, okay, there's some societal problem you want to solve. You want to call out these people. You want to understand how CA works. Then you start to spend time thinking about meta things about measurement and scanning. Right? So you move away from this one task to, oh, how does one measure? How does one do this effectively? What's the impact of this measurement on other things? And one of the other papers that we looked at is this idea of trying to figure out uh, who else was doing mass scanning and what kind of things happened from that mass scanning. So back again, we go back to our network telescope. You can never stop doing, once you do this, you can just never, it's like an addiction. So you go back to the network telescope and we use that to go back and again look at scanning behavior. And it turns out that some of these, these uh, internet-wide scanning things operate because they're stateless. What I mean by stateless is they don't keep a, a log on the server that's scanning of what they've scanned so far. Instead, they embed some state. They overload a bunch of packets, like uh, fields like sequence number and other things, which are at the client's discretion, and they put actual data in them. So that when you receive a response back, the state that you need to figure out you know, when that packet came out and what it was attached to is in the packet itself as opposed to uh, having to store some local state. What that also means is that for a bunch of these tools like MassScan and ZMap, you can fingerprint a packet that comes from ZMap. You can fingerprint a packet that comes from MassScan. And so you can go ahead and look at how much of this stuff is mass scan, how much of this is ZMAP. You can look to see what's on that network telescope. This is uh, three years ago now. Even three years ago, it was still 445. Everybody was still scanning for 445 because everyone is still infected with some version of Configure. If you remove 445 out, which is almost half of all the scanning traffic that you saw on the dark net, uh, sorry, on the network telescope, you can start to see what adversaries are actually looking for. Uh, things like ICMP, just doing an inventory, just here to figure out if you've got machines there or not. Don't care what they're running just yet, just want to build a database of where your computers are. SSH, which I'm sure you're all familiar with from brute forcing, HTTP, DNS, other things. Okay. Um, there were about 18,000 scans that targeted more than 1% of the IPv4 address case. We view these as people doing end-to-end -end surveys like ourselves. Um, there's about 100 ASs that are responsible for 85% of all the scan traffic. A couple things stand out in terms of who's doing this. There's us uh, and other folks. There is, I'm sure you've recognized if you look at your logs, China likes to scan you once a day. They've been scanning you once a day for many, many years in the exact same set of protocols and ports. Uh, identifying, uh, there's a whole bunch of this is happening in Bulletproof hostings. And you see things like Shodan and other folks that are trying to commercialize the engines. I won't talk about that. One of the other things that this has enabled us to do is sort of be positioned uh, 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 serendipitously for new kinds of events as they emerge in the internet. One of them that happened a couple years ago was this heartbeat vulnerability. Who remembers Heartbleed? Yeah, OK. <laughs> you remember Heartbleed because whoever the, the O level, the C level executive above you saw it in the newspaper, and then it became an emergency, right? Yeah, that's how that goes typically. So remember, this was a, some legacy artifact that you know, we don't want to run just TLS over TCP. We want to be able to run it in some limitations over something like UDP, which means you've got to rebuild back into the streaming protocol all the thing, nice things that TCP does, including some notion of keep alive. Okay, and so the way that that worked was that you would essentially, every once in a while, echo, uh, you send the server uh, a description, hey, here's four bytes, echo those four bytes back to me. Okay, and you would tell there was four bytes. Okay, and fortunately, the server trusted that when you said four bytes, you actually meant four bytes. And you had actually sent four bytes. So when it returned the data to you, it used that length to figure out how much memory to read and send back. So if, for example, you said that the length was 10,000 bytes, but you only sent zero bytes, which you could do, you would get the next 10,000 bytes in memory. Okay? And then, of course, it has all kinds of interesting things in it, like passwords and logins. Okay? 
Uh, it turned out that we thought there was a mechanism to actually go scan to see if you were a Heartbleed vulnerable server without actually giving you any bytes back. If you give you a zero byte length with a zero byte packet, you get a different response whether you're vulnerable or not vulnerable. And neither one of those responses includes any data from memory. So you could essentially knock on the door and ask whether or not you were Heartbleed vulnerable. Um, uh, one of the interesting things about this ecosystem is it took us uh, a good 48 hours to, well, 20, uh, between 24 and, and 48 hours to figure out how to do this legally and ethically. Uh, so we don't have data scanning at the very, very uh, beginning, but you can go back and look at some of the historical measurements and get some estimate that, that almost 40% of the top 100 websites in Alexa uh, were vulnerable at the time. We did, uh, when we were able to get our scanner up and running, we did not only scans the Alexa top 1 million, but scans more broadly of the entire internet. Uh, you find all kinds of things run web servers, all kinds of things run out of date and vulnerable web servers. Uh, my favorite was the point of sale system for the pizza company in Ohio someplace, um, in terms of fun things that were hardly vulnerable. Um, as I said before, there's this little gap here uh, uh, between when Heartbleed emerges, but we can look at the patching behavior now of the Alexa top 1 million sites, how they change over time, and the public IPv4 address space. You obviously get drawn here, what's happening here. These are huge things like GoDaddy and, and places that have huge numbers of websites massively patching everything at one time. Okay, so some coordinated patching behavior. One of the very interesting things is the first evidence we see in this paper of attacks precedes our ability as defenders to create and do the scanning ourselves. So we don't know concretely what was vulnerable at the time uh, that they attacked the ecosystem. Uh, we were able to watch who was scanning. Lots of people scanning from places whose reputation uh, you might make use of, like Amazon, uh, Bulletproof Hosting. China was very active at scanning. This, is, this was us again. Um, some folks from Latvia, but again, some bulletproof hosting and other providers. Um, one of the things you were supposed to do when you had, after you patched was to change your keys because your keys might have been in memory. Okay? So obviously, unencrypted private key in memory, bad idea, let's go re, uh, 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 get new certificates for everything. This is also one of my favorite stats uh, of the talk. Uh, only 10% follow this advice and actually change their certificates. 14% did exactly what they were told. They gave their exact same private key to another company, paid the money, and got a new cert with the old private key. Uh, one of the suggestions and the hope was that something like this was going to encourage adoption of uh, perfect forward secrecy, and it did not. As I was saying before, you start to get a sense of how you start with the societal goal, you get the sense of how the tool gets used and improve the measurement itself, and then you start to see these surprising things. And one of the things uh, that I think was very surprising that came out of this work is this idea that you can actually impact people's patching behavior by doing vulnerability notifications. So we follow our ethical responsibility once we had discovered this big pile of things that were vulnerable to go and tell people, hey, look, you're vulnerable. But it occurred to us, because there was some debate even within our research team, that how valuable is this going to be? No one's going to do anything anyway. Why should we have to go do this? Well, it turns out, let's go test it. Let's go ahead and uh, split the known infected host into two groups. We'll notify one group now, and we'll let the other one be in control, and we'll let that go for a week. And we're not going to let that go forever because we need to go notify everybody. Okay? But we'll see what difference there is in the patching rates over the week. And it turns out, a pretty significant one. There's a 47% increase in patching for this vulnerability if you tell me that I've got some problem. Okay? And then note, group B is notified here, which is also very compelling. Uh, it's the other inverse of that, of that A-B experiment. because by the time the next week comes by, the, the red line has almost matched the blue line. Right? So you notify them a week later, and they get back to the same patching level. 
Now, it's a lot more complicated than this. And I think Vern has an entire student that's, whose thesis is now based on this topic. But this was a surprising result. And again, it's this idea that you start with some societal goal, you build measurement infrastructure, you refine that infrastructure and their understanding of that, and it starts to lead to benefits and ideas and things that happen otherwise. And so I was going to talk a little bit about Mirai uh, as another example of these kinds of things. But I think uh, uh, I want to sort of maybe jump to the end and see if we have some time for questions. So as, as a sort of closing out, I want to leave with another one of these quotes um, from Stokes. So the other sort of interesting thing was he, he said, not only do we think of this wrong and, and how we approach what science is, but that science itself is going to change. Is that the prediction is that over time, more and more technology, things that we build, are going to be based off of our models or scientific models. And maybe this, this direction perhaps is not as surprising as the reverse direction, which is this idea that increasingly more and more science is going to be technology based. It goes right at the head of folks that say, you know, uh, uh, measurement of human artifacts as opposed to natural artifacts is not science. And so what I've tried to do today is talk a little bit about uh, how one tries to justify your success in a world in which all the bad lines are still going up and to the right. And it's about not only trying to make the world a better place now, but to have some impact that lasts and improves that process moving forward by impacting the fundamental pieces out of science. So that's all I have for you today. So I think we have some number of time for questions, eight minutes. Yeah. Or we could just go have coffee. Yeah. I got another question for you. Uh, I've covered your slides at things like 2003, Yeah. How many people in here? How many people in here do you think were doing internet security in 2003? It'd be an interesting see thing to see how many raised their hand. Raise your hand if you were doing security in 2000. Oh, that's not too bad. Sure, yeah. Well, bro had, bro had come, so obviously that's when the revolution started. <laughs>your ethics and legality of doing the scans? Does that, does that cause any issues? <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite slide uh, for that one. Oh, I, no, actually I have several favorite slides. My, uh, I think my favorite one, though, is we have been scanning at Michigan. Uh, 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 that team has been scanning for five or s five years now. Certainly on, on 443. And then, you know, every couple years we add another set of suite of protocols. And we still get the same number of abuse complaints per day as we got after, say, the first six months. And what's funny to me about that is that there is somebody on the internet today that will just realize that for the last five years, Every day, we have been looking for web servers in their network. And today will be the day that somehow they magically discover it. Uh, that, just, that just sort of blows my mind. Um, you know, uh, in terms of other kind of ethics things, you know, I think there's been a sea level change. One of the reasons I was reticent, you know, uh, I think I could share this honestly now. One of the, I think I was reticent to be involved in the original ZMAP project is I was unclear whether or not the tool itself was an ethical tool. Came from this view that would be reflected best by somebody like, I think, John Heidemann and ICSI, who has done large scale censuses of the internet, uh, but at really, really low packet rates. In fact, actually, the bar, believe it or not, uh, that he chose for his packet rates was the average amount of background radiation that you'd expect to see anyway, just the random junk. So if you would expect to see two or three random non-productive packets at an IP address, 
per hour, then that would be what he set his threshold scan rate for. And it's actually a good following of, of the ethical principle of, of both least surprise as well as no more than the harms that you experience in day-to-day -day life, right? We don't have this criteria for, for, for harms that we do no harm. We say we don't expose, we don't increase your harm profile, right? And that's, I think, that's kind of the things that he thought about. Uh, and I think we've changed our minds. I think this is just a state of the, I mean, uh, I think the benefits of this stuff has far outweighed the, um, uh, the, the criticisms. Uh, fully 60 or 70% when they complain, there's a blanket email that goes back out from the abuse team from Census and ZMAP. It goes back and says, here's what we're doing and why. And about 70 or 80% people say, fine. They don't want to be excluded. But yeah. Uh, there is an IRB for census, there is not for the ZMAP tool. Did you have a question? Well, um, I was just wondering, so how many more things do we get in the Six. Six. Six is the number. And it's been six for, for five years. Uh, there's a nice table in one of the graph, and the, figures out how they figure us out, which is actually very interesting, um, because occasionally you get proof. So you get an email, look what you're doing to my network, and you can see what the logs are. Uh, the fun ones are, you are running your VPN server on port 80, and so your VPN concentrator logs come back with this get request that it doesn't know how to parse, and so you get this really, you're trying to break into our machine. Uh, those are always fun ones. Uh, people just, you know, there, there is a distribution of, of clue in the internet. I think that's all I want to say about that. All right, let's have coffee. <laughs>